So we're actually in the process of developing a new electronic material. This is a graphitic material. is a new electronic material. And uh, we think we've overcame the biggest hurdles uh, that would stop carbon nanotube electronics while retaining the most essential features. Scientists built the first computer in 1937, but it could only do algebra. The first general purpose computer in 1946 was the size of 20 refrigerators. During the 1950s, transistors replaced bulky vacuum tubes. Then, integrated circuits replaced transistors. But the biggest breakthrough came in 1971 with the microprocessor. All the components on one minuscule chip. That's what made the personal computer possible. Packing millions of transistors onto these tiny silicon wafers is the job of chip manufacturers like Texas Instruments. Back in 1958, the inventor of the integrated circuit, Jack Kilby, managed to squeeze a single transistor onto his design. These days, the latest generation uses almost a billion and according to Moore's law, that number doubles every two years. As I understand it, Moore's law dictates that the number of transistors on a chip will double roughly every 24 months. Now, does that mean that the speed also doubles? Theoretically. Graphene is basically a layer of graphite, a single layer. It's a hexagonal array of carbon atoms uh, extending basically over two dimensions endlessly. That's what graphene is. It's basically the stuff that carbon nanotubes is made of, and it's the stuff that graphite's made of. Graphite is many layers of this same material stacked on top of each other. So it's an all-carbon material uh, made of hexagonal arrays of carbon. So I can take you to the nano world in just three easy steps. Here we are in the real world. I call that the macro world. And the measure here is the meter. I'm about two meters. So the next step is to go to the milli world. We're going to focus down a thousand times. So here in the milli world, the length scale is the millimeter. It's a thousandth of a meter. It's about the size of a flea or an ant. And I'm now a two millimeter man. But we're not stopping here. We're going down another step of a thousand times. We're off to the micro world. So now, we're here now in the micro world. This is what you would see through a microscope. You can see those living cells that are about 10 or 20 microns in size. I'm just two microns, so you have to look up to them. But we're not stopping, we're taking one last step, another focus in by a factor of a thousand, and we reach the nano world. So here we are at last. We've made it to the nano world in just three steps. This is the world of atoms and molecules. This is the world where physics, chemistry, and biology all blend into one because we're dealing with matter on the smallest possible scale. You get about four atoms to the nanometer. So I would be a two nanometer man. So this is the nano world. Welcome to the new frontier. In the best case, it could actually do things that silicon could never do. So it would be a, a real valuable two-dimensional electronic material that could surpass silicon in many of its properties it could have all the properties that carbon nanotubes have, plus an added advantage that you can easily interconnect them, and also that you can convert the material from semiconductor to metal just by shape and relatively simple chem chemical doping techniques. Silicon has special properties because it's what's called a semiconductor. That means that depending on how it's treated, silicon can either conduct or block the flow of electricity. It's this property that makes it ideal for supporting the millions of tiny transistors necessary for a modern computer chip. If you work with graphitic materials, graphene, on the surface of silicon carbide, you can use all the common steps used in uh, electronic processing that's now used for silicon and come with, uh, uh, with devices. Uh, you can do that on much finer scale than you can do with silicon. You can go all, all the way down to nanometers, and so you have, uh, you, you broke that barrier that, that uh, silicon is facing, going all the way down to the nano scale, which, uh, at which uh, uh, levels uh, silicon basically breaks down. You can't use silicon 
when it's made that small for a whole variety of reasons. It took decades to perfect the process of producing silicon with a perfect monocrystalline structure. They begin with raw polysilicon or poly and heat it to over 2500 degrees Fahrenheit inside a special sealed furnace which has been purged with argon gas to eliminate any air. The resulting lake of molten silicon is then spun in a crucible and a silicon seed crystal roughly the size and shape of a pencil is lowered into it while spinning in the opposite direction. As the molten polysilicon is allowed to cool the seed crystal is slowly withdrawn at around one and a half millimeters a minute. The result is a single silicon crystal weighing around 440 pounds and with a diameter of around 200 millimeters. The crystal is so strong its entire weight can be supported by a single thread just three millimeters across. But it is brittle and it must now be cut down to size without shattering. After testing with chemicals and x-rays to check its purity and molecular orientation, it's fed to a silicon salami slicer. The excitement actually started more than a decade ago when people studied carbon nanotubes and saw that it had really great electronic properties. And so the whole community, a whole community evolved out of that. We're looking specifically at uh, the properties of carbon nanotubes and from that evolved uh, the idea that maybe uh, carbon nanotubes uh, was only a specific form of graphene and that two-dimensional graphene might also be a useful electronic material. And so as, uh, I really thought that up in, in 2001, that perhaps two-dimensional graphene, the stuff of carbon nanotubes, could be used. As the race for the next breakthrough in computer technology reaches its conclusion, the scientific and commercial communities are watching closely to see who will reach the finishing line first. The team right now is very big. It includes many more people than the few that you see in this laboratory. It's become an international collaboration. And again, it's, uh, it's basic science all the way to applications being developed in parallel. So quite frankly, I think we're the only ones who are seriously working on developing graphene electronic material in the world. What will the world be like from this point of view in 20 years time? What will nanotechnology look like? Well, these things that you hold in your hand, your mobile phone, your computer, your digital camera, all of these things will become a lot less clunky. They'll be built into your clothes or into your glasses. Your home, which will be made of nanomaterials, will be full of sensors so as to pick up and respond to the environment. There'll be intelligent nanotechnology everywhere.